Hello and welcome to this, the first in a series of webinars organised by RoadSafe to explore how connected technologies can contribute to each of the pillars of the safe system approach to road safety. My name is Nick Reed, and I work in transport technology and road safety through my company Reed Mobility and I'm Chief Road Safety Advisor to National Highways. I'm also a trustee of RoadSafe and will be your host throughout this series. For those who don't know, RoadSafe is a charitable organisation that brings together public, private and the research sectors to foster collaboration and cooperation in the interests of road safety. We're very grateful to Bosch for their support of this webinar series and to Agilisys for their technical and logistical expertise in arranging these sessions. The first webinar will be looking at the role of safe infrastructure and we've come here to what's called NTOC, National Highways National Traffic Operations Centre, here in Quinton, just to the west of Birmingham. This is the nerve centre of the strategic road network and whether it's setting variable speed limits, monitoring CCTV cameras or coordinating the response to serious incidents, the team here at NTOC play a vital role in maintaining the safe and efficient use of our roads. Joining us here and online are seven fantastic panellists to discuss how connected technologies are helping to deliver safer road infrastructure. But before we meet them, we've made a short film to highlight some of the activities that happen here at NTOC. Hi, I'm Mel Clark. I'm Customer Service Director for Operations here in National Highways and I'm responsible for um, ensuring that road users get home safe and well using our strategic road network. Today's webinar comes live from the National Traffic Operations Centre where we work 24-7 making sure that traffic is managed and that we keep people safe on our roads. National Highways has safety as its first imperative and that's an easy thing to say but it's something that we live with every day. So let's start by talking about what we've achieved so far. Back in 2014, we reviewed the number of killed and seriously injured people on our roads. And we used data gathered between 2005 and 2009 to set the baseline for our 2025 targets. By 2020, we reduced the number of killed and seriously injured people on our roads by the agreed target of 40%. Our ambition now is to aim for 50% reduction by 2025. But of course our longer term ambition is zero harm and that's an aspiring ambition. How are we going to achieve that? Like many countries around the world, we use the safe system framework to inform our approach. We as the custodians of the strategic network have a key role to play and so too do many of you here today. Vehicle manufacturers, recovery and insurance industries, government, post-collision care providers and our road users themselves. This shared responsibility and a collaborative approach to road safety is how we will achieve our goals, which is why I'm delighted to see so many road safety colleagues here today. We'll be discussing one of the pillars of the safe system, safer infrastructure. We'll explore what role technology will play in the coming years in helping us to achieve our long-term goal of zero harm on the strategic road network. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Nick Reed, who will start the webinar. Brilliant, thanks Mel, that's a fantastic introduction and, and we now move into that discussion and welcome our expert panellists and I should highlight at this stage as well that if you have any questions feel free to drop those into the Teams chat or if you're on YouTube use the comments uh, to the right of your YouTube screen and we'll pick those up later in the discussion. Uh, but first, yeah, let's introduce the panellists. So first to my right, we have Jo from National Highways. Hi, thanks Nick. Hi, I'm Jo White. I'm the Acting Director for Roads Development and National Highways and I look after energy intelligent transport. I'm Susie Charman. I'm the Executive Director of the Road Safety Foundation. Uh, the Road Safety Foundation is a charity that's committed to safe system implementation um, and making road travel as safe as rail and air. And over the last 20 years, we've focused on safe road infrastructure through the um, Euro European Road Assessment Programme and IRAP, for which we are the UK programme lead. And Brad from Virgin Media O2. Yeah, hi, I'm Bradley Taylor. I'm from Virgin Media O2, and I sit within our data, AI, and insights team. Hi, Elizabeth Ponsford, also from Virgin Media O2, um, in the market development team. I look at how we can take the new technologies such as 5G and IoT to develop business applications that benefit our customers. 
Hi, and I'm Mel Clark. I'm the Customer Service Director for Operations here in National Highways. Thanks, Mel. And then we're joined by two panellists online. We have uh, Amy from TFL. Uh, hi, Nick. Thank you. And my name's Amy Fudel. I'm the Senior Road Safety Strategy Manager at Transport for London. Uh, so I'm looking to eliminate deaths and serious injuries, injuries on London's roads by 2041. Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. And finally, Matthias from Mercedes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Matthias. I'm heading Business Strategy and Data Driven Solutions at Mercedes Benz Urban Mobility Solutions. Um, so we're trying to make the best out of our cars, out of the car's data, and try to contribute to safer roads. So I hope that I have some interesting case studies also for you in my back. So I'm really looking forward to the session. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we're good. Excellent. <laughs> Apologies for that. So, um, Joe, some of the audience will have heard about National Highways Digital Roads Programme. Can you tell us more about this and, uh, and the potential contribution it can make to road safety? Thanks, Nick. So um, we launched Digital Roads back in July last year, um, and it's all about how we are looking to use data, technology and connectivity to improve and uh, transform the way that we operate, build and maintain the strategic road network in England that National Highways is responsible for. It centres around three themes. Um, the first is uh, digital design and construction, and in particular there we're looking at how much we can automate uh, construction activities in particular, how much we can remove uh, you know, hum the human from some of those construction activities and therefore reduce um, the risk and the number of fatalities in construction related um, activities um, you know, over the next sort of 20, 30 years. Um, the uh, second theme is around uh, digital operations, and that's about uh, using that data connectivity and technology to um, have a, a, a better understanding of everything that's happening on the network, enabling us to preempt events, to respond quicker to those events, and to manage those events quicker, and also to be able to holistically manage the asset in a much more um, uh, proactive way, um, responding to incidents more quickly and therefore, um, again, contributing to uh, reducing the number uh, of those killed and seriously injured and, and injured on the network in total. The final theme is around um, uh, digital for customers. This is very much about how we provide information to our customers, um, making them better informed, helping them uh, feel safe and confident and in control of the journeys uh, that they're undertaking taking, that they're able to plan them, that during the journeys they're getting the right information at the right time and in the right place, um, and then enabling them to have that really sort of positive journey experience on our network. Fantastic. Uh, Susie, kind of related to that, I think the, a positive experience on the network is, is a road that is well designed, and, and I know you mentioned the IRAP methodology in your introduction. Can you tell us more about that, and thinking particularly about how that's evolving in the era of, of connected and ultimately automated uh, vehicles? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Nick. Um, so IRAP gives us a safe system, proactive way of measuring and understanding risk across a network. Um, and it's really evolved over the last 15 to 20 years, so an awful lot of expertise has gone into the development of the model, and it's based as much as possible on the best evidence that we can find in research literature. So understanding how different road characteristics relate to um, the likelihood and the severity of crashes when they happen. Um, so as the vehicle fleet changes, we also need to change the model. So in anticipation of um, ADAS, Advanced um, Driver Assistance um, Systems, um, and more automated systems, um, we need to be thinking about things like white lines and how readable the road is. And indeed, um, there have been a few publications over the years from, the, um, from our family of charities on roads that cars can read. And also now, as vehicles are relaying tons and tons of information up into the ether, um, we're starting to see how some of that information can be used within the IRAP model. So IRAP um, is free to use, but it's also very data hungry. So it wants 52 characteristics every 100 metres across the network. Um, and actually, we're finding that we can glean some of that information from the connected vehicles of today. Um, the first sort of way that we've been doing that has been through using um, speed telematics data. So we get a really rich understanding of how um, how speed changes across the network. Um, and that really helps us with um, you know, really good intelligence to feed into that IRAP model. Um, and in light of that, we've been doing a project in the West Midlands um, 
for the Road Safety Trust, all about how we make telematic speed data available to as many stakeholders as possible. And so we talked about automated vehicles a little bit there. Joe, you talked about automation. Uh, Elizabeth, I know um, automated vehicles have had their fair degree of hype, um, and 5G is a, a similar technology where we're starting to see now some of the, the practical applications come through. And maybe you could tell us about um, Virgin, Media's O2, Virgin Media O2's um, role with, with 5G and its potential for road safety. Sure, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, 5G has had a lot of hype, and I think it's perhaps created a promise or an expectation that it's going to revolutionise things overnight and um, solve everybody's problems. But there are really two stages to 5G and how it will start to change things. The first, and it, and it links a little bit to what you've been talking about, um, Susie, is the high bandwidth activity. So this is about improving speed and capacity. So anything involving video, which is quite demanding of high bandwidth, is going to be able to enhance that and, and work that better. Um, allowing us to do things like video analytics, adding AI to data feeds that we're collecting from um, video and, and CCTV, whether that's video from, as I say, CCTV or from uh, uh, vehicles themselves. And then longer term, 5G is going to have new capabilities which support that even further. So ultra-reliable, low-latency communication, so being able to do process and respond in near real time, which becomes really important when you have autonomous vehicles, so the ability for vehicles to communicate with each other as well as the road infrastructure around them. So being able to anticipate um, stopping distances, hazards, incidents, so really massive benefit to road safety. And then the second, second thing, also picking up from your point, Susie, about um, vehicle data and telematics and all the infrastructure is going to be about supporting the mass collection of data from multiple sp spaces or places. So track it, trackers, cars, sensors around the whole traffic network and being able to orchestrate that data on a, on a very large scale and respond and automate activities, so really helping um, drive a seamless, safer experience. Uh, I think that links perfectly into, into you, Mel, the, the, uh, you know, seamless experience, uh, customer experience, um, and thinking about a near real-time response, the, the traffic officers and their role in keeping us safe and, and the future for the traffic officers. So maybe uh, yeah, you could tell yeah, us a little sure. about that. So, so most of us are never going to experience, hopefully, having to come to a stop on the strategic road network. Um, but in the event that you do, then you kind of really want to see a traffic officer there and effectively they provide our frontline response um, to incidents. So the ability to verify that incidents are happening on our network and get that response to those incidents is absolutely vital. Um, and equally, as much advanced information as you can have about what's happening at the incidents is really important as well. So that enables us to dictate then what other resources might be required to support um, the management of an incident on our network. So how quickly we need to get emergency services services there and um, how quickly we might need to get a recovery um, truck to scene to uh, actually reduce the impact on the customer experience as well as enhance the safety of those that are operating in that environment. Um, you know, traffic officers do a range of um, activities, they're highly trained professionals out on our network, um, so they're also addressing the welfare and the well-being, understanding how um, queues are building um, in a, as a result of an incident is really important, it helps prioritise decision making around diversion routes, prioritising decision making around um, getting welfare uh, resources out there, whether that's bottles of water in the summer or you know, space blankets in the winter, what is it that we need to do to look after people that might have been, um, might potentially be stranded on our network for some period of time. So all of that sort of data and intelligence that can come into a control room in particular, um, and, and we use a lot of technology in control rooms, whether it's CCTV imagery, whether it's um, information from the general public um, or other responders on our network, all of that sort of triangulates to inform the response that we would deliver and how we go about um, managing those incidents as well. And then of course our traffic officers play a role as general custodians of the network, so actually looking at the infrastructure itself, you know, when they're not attending incidents, um, they're actually caring about the infrastructure and actually um, looking at defects, potential hazards on our network, debris um, left lying around and actually how we're going to um, go and kind of tackle those um, issues and actually what is what, what sort of capability their vehicles and imagery that they have on their vehicles potentially give them in the future. So they have dash cams front and back, got body cameras as well, so there's actually a lot of capability within their own vehicles to kind of detect um, potentially some of the defects um, that are out on the network and allow us to kind of go and resolve those more rapidly as well. And, and Susie, does the, does the presence of a traffic officer service influence, does that come into IRAP? 
in any meaningful way? Can, can the presence of you know, the, the sorts of safety role that the, the traffic officers play, does that get included within IRAP somehow? So it's not really included as an attribute because the, the things that we do include are the sort of hard and fast kind of engineering measures that sure. a road authority can invest in and improve. But absolutely, they play a role, as Mel says, with, with identifying those defects. And the, the better we can get a safe system of appreciation into our traffic officer service, the better they're going to be doing it, really, and being able to report into that system to improve it. Fantastic. And, um, Amy, I'm going to turn, turn to you now, because in, in Mel's introduction, she talked about the, the ambitious goals that, that national highways have for, for road safety. And, and I know that that's matched, if not surpassed, by, by Transport for London. I know that the Vision Zero plan for, for no one to be killed or seriously injured on London streets by 2041. Um, so yeah, I was thinking, how is this plan evolving? And, and what's the role of connected technologies in delivering this ambition? Fantastic. Thanks. Yes. I'm really sorry. I'm going to mute you so there's no echo. So just beware. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, yes, no. As you say, we kind of uh, we've adopted the safe systems approach in London, uh, which is aiming to eliminate deaths and serious injuries from our roads by 2041, and that's based on the kind of five key pillars of safe speeds, safe behaviours, safe streets, um, safe vehicles, and post-collision response. And we're really clear that that needs to be a data-led process. So it needs to be responsive to evolving conditions on the roads. And we also need to be able to kind of tell that what we're doing works by what's happening in terms of the longer term trends. Um, so, for example, uh, the 2021 progress report that, uh, uh, that we've just uh, published, uh, it talks about how we're responding to motorcycle, the kind of uptake in motorcycles, particularly driven by the gig economy and the delivery, food delivery economy. Um, it also talks about the kind of e-scooter trials in London and the kind of other kind of emerging trends along those basis, on, the, on those kind of lines. But I think the safer vehicles one is really interesting here in terms of the context of what people have been talking here about technology. So we know that kind of technologies are in many ways uh, making reducing road danger harder. So we've stopped seeing the longer term decline in car use in London. And partly that's due to things like the ride hailing services, meaning that there are kind of uh, uh, though there's less uh, private car use, there's more kind of uh, private hire use. Um, we also know that cars are getting bigger and heavier. And those, and the, in the short term, we've also seen um, the emergence of e-scooters on the roads. We've seen a great big uptick in cycling coming out of the pandemic, which is really good news. Um, and we've also seen more motorcycles on the roads driven by things like delivery economy. That's how, kind of what we're seeing in the short term in London. But then there are kind of some real opportunities represented by technological change, too. So we've worked with um, Daimler in, uh, and you have probably seen this kind of work in, in other forums, to understand road risk using connected vehicle sensors. And so what that was, was using their kind of um, in-car vehicle sensors to build a kind of picture across all of their fleet. Um, to understand uh, discrepancies in uh, like where they were flagging um, near miss events and so what that allowed us to do was identify discrepancies between what our internal modeling was telling us was the most kind of dangerous areas in london and where we were seeing lots of near misses because we think that a near miss should be a kind of reasonable predictive uh, element of whether you might get a kind of a, a death or a serious injury to um, it also identified areas and risks that we previously lacked intelligence on and because it was daimler and uh, mercedes-benz yeah, we discovered that the back of harrods is apparently uh, full of near misses um, and it also kind of gave us a value for kind of the longer term ambition of this is that we have leading data, not lagging data. So we're not waiting to see someone killed, seriously injured or slightly injured in a kind of serious in a major collision before we act. So we really hope to be able to kind of say if we can have near miss data, then we don't need to wait for someone to be injured to know that there is a problem at that area. So it really is kind of very kind of hopeful and it could really could bring us a sea change in the way that we think about road danger reduction, which I think is really positive. Um, so there's some really kind of uh, valuable opportunities here. But obviously, the thing is, how can we integrate and build on that work? But also, how can we move from just working with one manufacturer to building a kind of uh, a wider view that looks across all vehicles that are out on the roads, all of which have their own internal sensors on to kind of actually build this kind of better, wider public good, I think. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. And, uh, and coming to you, Matthias, Mercedes obviously a, a manufacturer that's well associated with uh, advanced safety systems. But maybe you can build on, on what Amy's discussed and, and tell us what, what was the perspective of Mercedes on that, uh, on that trial with Transport for London? Yeah, uh, hopefully it's, it's not a coincidence that I'm part of the session. So, um, yeah, as I've already mentioned in the beginning, um, um, we're, I think, well known as one of the safest cars in the world, uh, the brand that stands also for safety and innovation in that field. Um, but we were thinking about how can we take it to the next level, so to say. And, and I think London is the perfect area, the perfect um, 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 city to start with, because we were looking for the one of the most advanced cities across Europe when it comes to road safety. And we were thinking in the beginning, how can we now take it to the next level? How can we take another step on our way to Vision Zero? Because that's an easy thing for both of us. You, you can imagine that there are, of course, some discrepancies in the interests between a city and an OEM. But when it comes to safety, we are really united in the same same goal. So that was a great starting point um, when we started back in 2019, I think, together with Rikesh um, in the beginning, and then, of course, also with the SHE team and then Amy as well, um, when we were talking about that. And we were starting with nothing, to be honest. So, And what we did, we took the task of uh, creating a solution that makes London streets safer. So not only the drive of a Mercedes-Benz uh, driver is safer, but really taking care about the city. So trying to, to achieve a higher safety on city level. And then we figured out that we have some very, very valuable insights because we are detecting those near miss events that are recorded by our advanced driver system systems. So whenever our clients gave their consent to share the data, we get a full report sent to our backend um, in case there was a risk of a collision. So um, you can imagine um, some other OEMs and some other parties are, are of course providing almost same data. They are referring to harsh braking events, for example. But what they are lacking, they're lacking a bit of the context our systems also share and report the context of the situation. And that's the powerful thing. We describe the situation and we, so to say, put ourselves in the situation just based on data. So we know what the situation looked like, where it happened, and was there a pedestrian involved? Was it a cyclist? Was it another car? Um, and how close was it to a collision um, in seconds? And what was the escalation and the reaction of the car to avoid that crash? coming from or starting from an acoustical warning until a real automated emergency break, which is, of course, then close to really uh, a crash happening. So that's what we what we started with. And, and then we also figured out that we are lacking a bit of, of coverage um, also in London. So and what we also thought about, how can we now really create a model um, that is also uh, filling the gaps that, that we have as Mercedes-Benz? So we took into account the patterns, the infrastructure, how it was looking, and as well at some points, because I think one of you also said it, it's about guidance rather than just a, a data lake no one can swim in. So um, it's really about providing that that guiding information that helps you and the experts to react on a, on a daily basis. So and this is what we did, and this is what we're really proud of. Um, and in a way, also London made us think about the next steps and how can we take it to the next level and how can we learn from this. And, and now we are at the point where we have a scalable solutions, a solution that is applicable all over Europe. And, and uh, we only can, can thank, I think, the, the colleagues from TFL as well to support this project and to be open to that. Because what we learned and what we hope is really that this is one of the building blocks, and we know that it's not the building block, but one of the building blocks on our way to Vision Zero, which is one of the important, most important tasks that we have. Fantastic. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see that the cooperation between the vehicle manufacturer and, and the city transport authority. Um, now, Brad, whenever we, we talk about infrastructure for road safety, I think the natural instinct is to think about asphalt and barriers and so on. Um, but I, I've always been keen to think about digital and, and communications infrastructure as part of that same landscape. So, so tell us about what uh, Virgin Media O2 has been working on in, in that space. Yeah, so I think uh, what's prevalent in the transport industry, particularly over the, probably the last five years or so, is the digitization of infrastructure. 
And uh, I think one good example of that is uh, the uptake and increase that we've seen in IoT devices, which are playing a really big role in essentially creating connections between unconnected infrastructure. And I think while we see value in this, uh, we also understand that people need to also respond to that infrastructure. And we can play a role in that and, and, and interpret how people are responding to connected and unconnected infrastructure. So what we do is we essentially use aggregated and anonymized data, which is captured from our mobile phones, and it, it helps plan and understand travel demands and people movements and how they interact with the road network, the highway network, uh, the station network, all that kind of uh, various different modes of transport. And I think what's, what's really important here is that there's travel patterns are changing dramatically, and we can see that in the last couple of years in particular, where we've seen huge drops in people numbers on the trains, uh, and an increase in the road network and people traveling at different times of the day. So I think where we can play a role and aid the conversation with that is to help with understanding real-time data or near real-time data and big data sets to interpret how people are traveling now as opposed to necessarily what happened a couple of years ago. So I think we need to move away from the traditional ways of transport modeling, transport planning, and move to a more real-time basis and understanding of how people are moving their behavioral habits uh, from different transport modes, even with active travel modes and, and e-scooters and things like that. So where we can help is provide that near real-time data. So we're furnishing with a lot of our customers with near real-time understanding of people movement uh, and also understanding about whether the, what types of modes they're taking. Uh, and what we've been able to do, particularly over the last couple of years, is add in more contextual data and demographic type data, which plays, again, another really important role, because are they someone who's a working professional, or actually are they someone that stays at home more regularly, or potentially maybe they're disabled and those things, and they need different travel, uh, typical travel methods and uh, patterns. So we're in a really good position now to support modeling companies that are playing in this digital twin space uh, and trying to understand real-time scenario planning. So uh, we're working with uh, both system integrators and public and private sector customers offering these large data sets to help understand the, the change in these behavioral habits. That's really interesting and, and it, for me it, it kind of triggers thoughts. So I think all of the, the speakers in their answers have mentioned collection aggregation analysis of data and I wondered Joe Mel and, and Amy as well maybe what how does that change how you have to work the skills you need to have the, the, the IT systems you need to, to have to support that uh, wealth of data that's coming in Joe do you want to start? Shall I, <laughs> shall I start? Well um, so I think it's you know it's fascinating to see how quickly everything is transforming and traditionally we've relied on fixed infrastructure on the road network where we you know we're, we're measuring traffic flows and speeds and using it to manage um, lane utilization or speed management um, all linked back to the control offices and clever algorithms and, and things like this and actually the, the clever algorithms I don't think will ever go away which is great as a mathematician um, uh, the bit that we are really sort of learning about is the value that we of the data that we can get from vehicles um, or, or devices in vehicles um, uh, moving and and how we analyze that data and then how we use it in our existing work practices and how we, we use it to learn about travel on the network um, and clearly uh, where you know we have areas of our network that are, that are instrumented with, with lots of technology and we have lots of probably the majority of the network that isn't instrumented and actually the value of the data we can get from floating vehicles is, is you know immense really in particularly in those areas um, where we don't have that kind of data you know single carriageways and, and so on so I think it is about becoming more digitally skilled more digitally literate um, and you know, recognising that things are transforming. We're not just about civil engineering. Actually, we are about that digital space and, and in how we work. Mel? Yeah, and, and for me, it's, it's about the 
practical applications of some of this, and we're already doing some of it actually. So we've rolled out single view of the network into our control rooms, or we're about to sort of in the process of doing, and that's using things like crowdsourced data and information about aspects of roads that we wouldn't necessarily have any real visibility of what was going on on them. So, you know, our all-purpose trunk roads don't benefit from CCTV coverage and, and, you know, routine traffic officer patrols. Actually, now we can understand what's going on on those bits of our road by drawing in crowdsourced information and data. And then sort of the practical applications of some of these technologies out on our network through CCTV, for example, might be things like, you know, how are cust uh, drivers interacting, behaving on our infrastructure, how is that working? So, you know, is it um, how they're behaving in terms of lane changing or tailgating or driver distraction activities? You know, is there applications that we can apply to some of this technology that helps us understand how drivers are actually responding to our network and, and complying actually with, with some of the rules of our roads that are designed to keep them safe? So it's all really exciting stuff and actually we're already starting to step into drawing in those different data sources and looking at the practical applications you know, in a real live environment. And, and maybe the, uh, how has TfL had to respond in terms of the collection and analysis of data? I know, you know TfL's obviously done huge amounts in terms of open data, but this kind of ingesting data from a, from a, a, a number of vehicles across the city, how, how has TfL had to respond to that? Well, I think we're kind of basically sitting at the middle of a pivot where we're going to move from having quite kind of uh, a combination of very close interrogation of the Stats 19 police reporting and also some surveys of the kind of local areas where you actually physically send people out. But you're maybe moving to a position where you see much more of um, kind of data science approach where you're looking at kind of much bigger data sources which are much more abstract in order to tell you what you need to know at a granular level about the kind of wider network. And where the kind of real thing to stay on top of there is one, you need a different skill set, but two, you need to be able to bring that back down to your stakeholders and you also need to be able to be an intelligent client for that. So I'm not a data expert, I'm not a data scientist, but I need to be able to sit with Matthias and be, like, be able to kind of interrogate him and say like, okay, so how is this working? And also understand enough about it to say, I mean, I think our interpretation is wrong there and we should be measuring this in a different way. Um, so I think the next kind of five, 10 years should be kind of really interesting for how this we start to see this kind of come forward in the way that we work. Um, so yeah, kind of really big uh, changes afoot, I think. Fantastic, thanks, Amy. And um, Elizabeth, I, I think when organisations talk about how infrastructure can change to support road safety, I think often there's the thought that there's, it's, a, it's a new gadget, it's a new system that needs to be integrated. but. I think there's more that can be done with existing assets and, and, and maybe you can tell us about how Virgin Media 02 are working on, on that uh, side of things. Yes, of course. And I'm going to use um, a TfL example actually to help bring this to life. So we've talked quite a lot today about CCTV and video cameras and there's lots of information that can be gleaned from that. Um, the solution that we've recently developed called Spatial Insights is, is using that existing infrastructure of cameras to, uh, together with AI, to pull out even more data that enriches what we have already today. So to, to give you an example of what we're doing with TfL, we have deployed this solution in one of the tube stations in the London Underground, designed to look out for incidents and behaviours happening with passengers within the Underground. So quite different to road safety, but equally the same types of application can be applied. And for that, it's about looking retrospectively at patterns of behavior. So it might be people traveling with um, buggies or prams. It might be people who are jumping the gates and avoiding fares, which they wouldn't necessarily respond to in real time. But that data is really important to understand about planning. And then also using the same solution to look out um, and alert staff within the station to incidents and risks that they can respond to in real time. So it could be everything from workplace violence to people or items on the track to trespass. Now, if we take that into a road environment, those same kind of use cases apply. So everything from stranded vehicles through to obstructions or pedestrians in the road, um, collisions, where you'd want a real-time response. And that is in a live road network that can also be used within uh, road infrastructure while it's being built for the construction. Roadside workers who are working in very dangerous, at times very risky environments, to look out and be alerted to things like people plant interface, slips, trips and falls, injuries, trespass, um, and whether or not they're wearing the right PPE. 
So it's, it's taking those real-time feeds to be able to get a, a more detailed and real-time picture of things that are happening to be able to respond um, and also understand the patterns and behaviours to plan in future, whether that's informing training even or, or changing the, the way we communicate with road users. Uh, I'm sure all of that is kind of music to your ears, is Mel. How are you going to a response to that? Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome, yeah. So, no, I mean, it, it really is music to my ears. And it is, again, it comes back to that practical application. But I can think of so many, and you, you explained some examples of how we could do that, but so many ways in which we can um, protect not only our road users, but also our own, um, our own workforces yeah. um, and, and in our supply chain as well. When we're looking at actually intelligence use of data that's telling us things about how we're interacting with that network and um, which I mentioned before the pattern stuff is really interesting as well so actually whether you can influence travel demand management by understanding how patterns are changing because they have changed since the pandemic so um, you know we mentioned earlier that people are coming onto our network at different times that may be reducing risk in some areas it might be increasing risk in others do we understand it mm -hmm. actually how are we influencing when people come onto our network what they're doing when they come onto our network mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's definitely music to my ears um, Susie, the, the IRAP methodology, how can, how can organisations best build that into the sort of normal, um, their normal workflow? How does that become part of everyday um, working practices and, and designs for roads to ensure that we're always progressing towards the higher and higher standards of road safety? So the IRAP methodology um, does lots of things for road authorities and indeed for um, the regulators. So the first thing that it does is provide a safety performance indicator that's really easy to understand, um, star ratings, just like going to a hotel. We all know what a five-star hotel is like and what we're aiming for is in the safe system is five-star roads. Um, so the road authority can set themselves a desired level of performance. Um, for example, national highways were aiming for 90% of travel to be on three-star above roads by 2020, which is actually pretty difficult to achieve um, in comparison to hotel standards, I might add. Um, but when we have five-star roads, that means that we have a safe system. So um, the, the real challenge there is it won't be tomorrow. Um, so really, IRAC can help with the developer, development of the strategic planning for that. that how do you... How do you create the roadmap to get there? Um, what, what's the investment needed? What's the sort of strategic approach needed? Equally, it helps with prioritisation. So you can't tackle every road tomorrow. You've got to try and work out where your greatest um, return is going to be for your investment. So again, it can help you to prioritise, often combined with historical crash data, to work out where your greatest impact is likely to be. The IRAP star rating metric tells you where you've got the greatest opportunity to improve a road. Um, and then your crash density, for example, your number of crashes per kilometre tells you where you've got the greatest opportunity for casualty savings. So those two in combination can be really, really powerful for um, prioritisation. Um, also, um, it helps you with the re rehabilitation of existing roads. So um, it gives you an appreciation of risk in, in a way that you haven't had before because our actual crashes are sort of random and sporadic and we're actually doing pretty well, so they're quite dispersed across the network. So you need better intelligence about where risk is. So the IRAP methodology gives you that and it gives you an opportunity to also test the, the effectiveness of different countermeasure programmes as well. So it gives you the chance to do a bit of optioneering and to see how many face and serious injuries you might um, reduced by doing option A versus B versus C and so on. So it gives you an awful lot of information that you can apply to your network and also you can apply it to new designs. But in light of this conversation, I would also say that I think that IRAP provides you a way of swimming in that data lake. Um, what on earth are you going to do with all that data? I mean, it's really exciting data. I love the OEM data where, you know, you can get um, aversive action um, in inputs and so on. But what do you do with it? Well, actually, I'd love to have it in the IRAP model, please. I'd love to have um, an indication of, oh, there's a really, you know, a, a bend that people are really struggling to negotiate where lane keep assist is activated. Or I'd love to know where delineation isn't really good enough, where the vehicle sensors can't pick up the white lines, because that tells me where, you know, human drivers might also be struggling, particularly the elderly, with reading the road and so on. So there's a huge amount of um, ways in which the IRAP um, model can actually provide an accommodating place for that fantastic data that we all get really excited about. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, how IRAC can be used. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great, and I, I'm, I'm really taken by the role that the data from vehicles can, can play in that. And some of the comments that have come in online have related to, to what Matthias has, has been talking about, and um, 
the extent to which you can make that direct link between issues with the infrastructure and the and the driver errors, the, the, the incidents that you see, the near misses that you see on the network. So, Matthias, I, I wonder if you could comment on that, the, the connection between near misses and incidents from the data you're collecting and, and how you disentangle driver error from um, poor design of the infrastructure. And the, the easy answer is that we don't refer to driver behavior and then also not to the driver's error, so to say. We are only referring to the system data that we get. So whenever the car detects the risk of the collision, then we refer to the data point. So we don't know, we don't even know about the behavior of the driver. So we only know that our vehicle saw the risk of a collision and acted, reacted accordingly, just with an acoustical warning or really with an emergency braking. So that's how we, we see it. And, and that's a bit the tricky thing also about it that we don't really refer to the driver distraction topics and, and stuff like that because we only refer to the system data. But what we see is, when we're referring to the data and to the systems, then we get a way more precise picture of the situation that we would not get in case you would only refer to harsh braking events or, or situations like that. So that's that's a bit the easy answer, um, but it's of course also a challenge to, and, and I'm completely with the IRAP um, and model that's so powerful also to include all the factors and driver's behavior and distraction um, is definitely a, a topic. And, and we're also trying to, to figure out how we can include information like that into our, into our systems and our solutions. But for now, um, I think we, we take what we have uh, and that's also already a, an important step, I think. And Nick, you also mentioned that we, we should really take what we already have at hand what we can use today, not in five or ten years when AVs hit the road. No, we should take what we what we already have, and this already solves some of the solution uh, problems that you've that you've mentioned. Um, our vehicles already sense or, and see the quality of lane marking at night, at day, at heavy rain situations. Um, they already detect the traffic signs. They figure out if they can read it properly, if they're even existing there, or if the wind blow blew it away. Um, that's the that's what we already have today, and what we really should should make use of and 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 start using. And then, of course, there might be some new and next steps um, um, in the field of development, and also in the field of of data usage. I think um, and that really can benefit. We can benefit from that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And um, I think. Thinking about the, those next steps and where we go with, with road safety, one of the biggest changes we've seen in road design has been with the introduction of the low traffic neighbourhoods in London, Amy. So clearly that's been a hot topic. I wonder how you've been using data to understand the success of those low traffic neighbourhoods and also um, where, 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 where it goes next. Where might you choose to install the next low traffic neighbourhood based on data? Is that something you've been working on? Um, so. LTNs are basically really good news from lots of different perspectives, but also, as everyone on the call will be very aware, have been incredibly politically contentious. Um, and uh, I think one of the really important things here is about kind of case making for LTNs. And so lots of councils are looking at this in really kind of close detail and looking at where they've put in LTNs that have worked and why they've worked. And I know, for example, like Lambeth has done some really good work with the flow on, the, on, on looking at exactly kind of what they were seeing from a particular LTN in their area that they'd implemented. Um, but we know from academic research that they kind of uh, are seriously good news for road safety. So um, LTNs uh, in the last three years uh, saw road traffic injuries half relative to the rest of London. Um, but there's kind of a, quite a wide uh, kind of data set that can be collected. Um, so you, obviously the kind of the traffic cycle and pedestrian counts are kind of really valuable, but also potentially like the origin and destination of those kind of traffic movements for public case making. So if you could show that you've got more people, I don't know, walking or cycling to within the area or to businesses within the area, whereas you previously had a lot of cars just driving through the area and not stopping, not investing in the local economy, then that's quite a strong local case that you can make. If you can then also measure the air quality statistics to say like, look, it's improved here or there here and there. You've obviously got Stats19, you've got resident views and responses. There's a really wide range of data sets that we can kind of pull together to make a kind of public case for A, where you should intervene, and B, whether or not like to kind of 
groups bring everyone with you to keep it in place um, and that's obviously not only within LTNs but also on boundary roads as well to say like it's not just that we created this nice little bubble here it is that the wider area the wider borough or the wider neighborhood has benefited ultimately from this intervention too so I think it's about how you kind of use evidence to bring people on board and that's the kind of most valuable use of the kind of data and technology that we've got at the minute. Fantastic. Thank you, Amy. And um, I think that, Joe, that links to what kind of national highways goals, not only around safety, but also on sustainability. Mm. And I wondered if you'd tell us about um, how those two can be combined sort of through rationalisation of infrastructure on the network. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So um, I think, like I said, you know, previously, is you know, to, to date, we've mostly relied on uh, fixed infrastructure on our networks, so the detectors, CCTV, um, uh, uh, well, a communications network, or all sort of feeding back to the control offices. Um, one aspect we are looking at is very much that whole point of do we really need all this physical infrastructure down the side of the roads, especially when we've got the opportunities with data and connectivity? Um, and what additional services and existing services do we need to provide? So very much focused on that service provision, um, but looking at, A, is there already um, infrastructure out there that can do the job? So if we have a, an additional service, say um, pedestrian detection, have we already got kit out there we can use? Um, can we use data and augment that with, with the existing uh, data we've got? Um, and actually, over time, where can we start to remove some of this infrastructure? And I think um, part of our digital roads vision was, was what was termed naked roads, which is not necessarily um, nothing out there and still obviously monitored and, and um, evaluated in, in some form, whether that's through um, uh, vehicle data, uh, sensor data, or uh, fixed infrastructure. Um, but actually, really looking at the opportunities to, to optimize that the infrastructure we've got out there at the moment um, so it has a safety benefit so that, that you know the less infrastructure we've got the less is required to be maintained the less we need to send road workers out to maintain it and so on um, and there is this sustainability um, aspect as well there's a there's a, a good road design aspect to that you know we reduce the clutter um, that's potentially out there we'll all have seen the pictures of lots of fixed road signs on certain roads um, of, of various networks across the world, um, but actually the opportunity to reduce our, our, our infrastructure on the network, um, and then from a you know a sustainability point of view, focusing on the solutions that do offer us the kind of most sustainable. So we're not having to go out, install a bit of technology, and then find it's out of date very quickly, and therefore it needs replacing. And actually looking at how what are the whole life costs, going back to the point about value for money, and making sure we're really optimising. On, on that that aspect as well. So yeah, safety wise, lots of stuff in there around rationalisation and absolutely in terms of sustainability as well. And and that in particular, again going back to that driver experience of, you know, that kind of green, kind of um, clean environment uh, as you drive through the network. And again, it's cropped up again. Data. Uh, Brad, and come to you on, on if, with all this data that's going around with, with GDPR, with the security of that data, how can we make sure we, we maintain pr privacy and, and uh, ensure that uh, you know, um, people's data is managed um, appropriately? Yeah, so we all need to be mindful of, of, of this and whenever we, we collect uh, people-based data, personal data, whatever that may be, I think all organisations play a role in this, regardless of whether you're a data provider, a data aggregator, a data user, kind of whichever you, you know, side of the fence you sit on, you have a responsibility to the people's data that you collect. That could even be you know, your own employee data, for example, which is personal and you need to be protected. So I think uh, everyone, uh, every organization has a role to play, but obviously the ones that provide data as a service then you know another level comes into it, and as you've already alluded to there um, with uh, GDPR, that plays a massive role in in ensuring that our customer data that we capture from mobile phones is protected and is completely anonymised, and there's no way of being able to uh, identify any individual. So we have a responsibility which we take, and we do in all of our products. So we undertake all of our due diligence and undertake data impact assessments throughout every single product that we provide 
uh, and even before some of them come into the teams that then start to productize that data, it needs to be anonymized and aggregated. So it's, it's super important. But, but I think one of the things to probably point out is, is whilst we have GDPR at the moment, uh, we need to make sure that policy does keep up with technology because technology moves at an incredibly fast uh, rate of which it is, it is now. And uh, we can't let policy necessarily leave that behind. So uh, the organizations like that we work for take a, take a role in that. Uh, but we need to make sure that as new technologies come on board, such as IoT, that we actually understand how these devices communicate with each other and the information that they've captured, because that's a whole different uh, ball game that we've we haven't really entered into yet. I don't think um, with with necessarily having device to device to device communication. So it's it's policy needs to make sure that it keeps up with that technology change. I'd say as well. And, and with that one eye on the future, um, Matthias, I, I know you mentioned the future plans for um, for the, the Mercedes. It was a trial in London, um, but where, where's that going next? I know you, you have a project in the Netherlands. Maybe you could tell us something about that. Yeah, I, I would say we, we now reached also the, in the next level. I think the, the project with TFL marked a bit the starting point, I think, of our activities in that field. But what we learned from there is that we really um, have a lot of power when we refer to the vehicle data and we really can play a role in, in making the infrastructure uh, more sustainable, safer, and, and also the traffic flows more efficient. And this is how we, we took it from there. And, and now only, I think, two to three months ago, we, we won a huge tender in the Netherlands. So now Mercedes-Benz is analyzing the entire street network in the Netherlands. So together with the ministry and Rex Waterstaat that most of you might know um, is the biggest road operator in the Netherlands. We are analyzing the entire street network on a daily basis just with the customer fleet. So we don't retrofit any cars. We just refer to the customer fleet that is out there. Of course, GDPR conformity is ensured at all times. And we are detecting potholes, surface damages, even small scratches in the surface. We are detecting slippery road events to, to inform their winter management. Um, we are trying to predict also the, the development of the, of the infrastructure. Um, how was an pot, a pothole looking in, in February? How does it look in March? And what was the development to also anticipate um, and when there is a need for, for mitigation of that risk. And we also bring in our capabilities in the fields of road safety. So um, we are talking about 130,000 kilometers of street network. We're talking 1,500 users of our data um, from strategic planner to really road operator and, 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 and a service person that is going out there. Um, and um, we're talking about two years of a project duration where we will learn a lot and and um, as you can see from my face or read from my face, I'm I'm pretty proud about this because this really shows that we can contribute um, uh, to to safety and that we can contribute also to more efficiency when it comes to infrastructure management, for example. And I hope, and that's my personal hope, that this is just the starting point, and and this will not um, remain the big biggest lighthouse project in Europe, but many, many other road operators on a national level, on a local level will follow and, and will hopefully um, also um, make use and benefit from the data that we, we can provide there. So yeah, I think it's a good round to, to also um, a wish for that. Um, um, and I'm, I'm really, really about this because this will will take us to the next level. Data based infrastructure assessment will be in the next years. Thank you, Matthias. And I've been feeding in some of the comments and questions that have come from uh, from the audience. But one one specific question that's come in, and um, I think I'm going to direct it to you, Joe, oh. <laughs> is is about. Um, Areas for collaboration on degrading road surfaces. How can we work collaboratively mm. to address um, the, the, the degradation of road surfaces and, and um, restore the roads or, or identify the, the, the issues sooner? That is a great question. And actually, you know, we've talked a lot about data and connectivity and technology, but actually, fundamentally, the road surface will always be part of 
the safe system and, and will be the fund is all existing is the fundamental thing that provides the connectivity from A to B physically physical connectivity so it it is really important and again from a safety aspect it's really important that the road surface is you know is is functioning to the, to what it was designed to function to so um, where we can get information about um, you know degrading road surface I think that's that's a you know really important actually um, it's about us working with industry in particular that collaboration with our supply chain um, making sure you know from you know the the kind of standard side of it as well that we are um, bringing in that sort of that review and feedback into sort of the continuous improvement element of the work that we do and making sure we're updating our standards and um, accordingly and also recognizing the development of um, self-healing um, materials and so on so I think I th certainly think lots of opportunity for collaboration um, data from vehicles uh, supply chain um, just you know, and and um, all you know, all the other sort of uh, industry bodies involved in providing that sort of um, that that part of the the chain. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess just just to add to that, we've what we've been doing previously uh, is working with a lot of local authorities and how we help pulling on the thread of digitisation of the infrastructure and in particular roads in this case is, is what I think we need to do is make use of the existing vehicles that are out there whether that be a, a highways uh, van that's that's doing its patrols or a refuge van for bin collection and those types of things uh, so we've been looking at how we can use that existing uh, those existing vehicles using onboard technology, whether that be from new cameras that are installed or existing cameras from slightly newer vehicles, which are, which which Matthias will obviously talk about a bit more. And um, and what we do is we add our AI technology that sits on top, and we're able to determine the uh, road surface, uh, whether there's any potholes, whether there's major issues. And the idea is not necessarily to to arm. Uh, will ask the local authorities or the road network operator to, to fix everything that's out there, but it's really to help prioritise and target the key areas that need to be addressed first, because obviously the biggest potholes are likely going to be the ones that cause the biggest issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're just trying to arm uh, local authorities and road operators with that information. Sadly, there isn't time for Matthias to speak more on the, on the topic because, uh, because we've run out of time for today. Um, it's been a fantastically rich conversation here at NTOC and uh, incredibly indebted to all of the panellists both here and online, Matthias and, and Amy joining remotely. Um, and, and also to National Highways for hosting us here in this uh, fantastic facility. Again, thanks to Bosch and Agilisys for their support in uh, the, the webinar series. And of course, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to participate and send your, your comments and questions in to the event today. Um, the next in the series of this uh, Road Safe webinars will be on connected technology and post-crash care. And that once in two weeks' time, it will be hosted at Northwest Fire Control, where we will be looking at some of the latest innovations in the detection, analysis, and response to road incidents with another panel of superb experts. Uh, that will be 2 p.m. on May the 30th, so two weeks today, and I hope to see you there. But for now, thanks very much for watching. Stay safe on the roads, and goodbye.